And welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, ESG, and wherever else the waves take us. This is part two of a two-part series. In last week's episode, we were talking to Nicola White, a reporter from Bloomberg, and Alan Wilson, CPA and securities attorney from Wilmer Hale, about a recent proposal that could add more oversight by the SEC to the Financial Accounting Standards Board, known as the FASB. For decades, the FASB's work in setting generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP, in the U.S. has generally moved forward independently. But their slow pace of rulemaking, the Inflation Reduction Act, and recent cries for more accounting guidance over crypto have people calling for the SEC to get more involved in the FASB. If you haven't heard last week's episode, you'll definitely want to check it out. I would pause right now and just throw back, because we do a lot of table setting there, and we're going to continue here. And now let's get back to Steve and Catherine chatting with Nicola White and Alice Milson as they talk more about the FASB's independence, the proposed climate rule, crypto accounting, and more. Could this actually go potentially in the opposite direction of what the Investor Advisory Committee is saying, where, hey, we think the FASB needs to be more politically independent when actually the opposite might? Because if you have a very active SEC, which by design, tends to flip just a little bit based on whoever's in the White House and who is appointing the SEC chair. I mean, again, it just feels like this is going to have the complete opposite effect of what the advisory committee was saying. And I can't be the only one who is having that reaction or who is thinking that. That's that's a totally valid perspective. Um, That absolutely could be the case. Um, I mean, this is a very for example, the you know the SEC we have right now is extremely active, and it's even really active in the accounting space, which um, is, is typically the SEC is pretty hands off. Um, you know, there's been some staff accounting bulletins that have uh, you know like the recent um, crypto holding um, staff accounting bulletin um, created a lot of waves. Um, the climate plan has like 50 pages of uh, new audited disclosures in it. And, um, you know, people in the accounting world are like, well, if that was something that was put out by FASB, it would have been debated ad nauseum before, before the public saw it, debated in public ad nauseum before the public saw it. Whereas, you know, the SEC proposal like landed like a 300 page brick <laughs> the day that it came out and everybody's fr- frantically and, and the audited disclosures are such a tiny part of that huge plan. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. You, you just, you just don't know. And tying things more to Washington definitely um, could open up FASB to more influence from, from the, the politics end of things. So, Alan, you and I have been having a long-running dialogue about – we're shifting gears here just a little bit – a long-running dialogue about when the SEC is going to adopt the climate proposal guidance. Uh, Of course, we saw very recently that they reopened the comment period due to a technological issue. Now, I've I've backed off of my conspiracy theories just a little bit after finally listening to Chair Gensler's testimony to the Senate Banking Committee. This does seem a bit fishy. Um, I, I'm just wondering, again, totally shifting gears away from the FASB, wondering if you have any thoughts on how that might impact the way this whole climate thing lays out. Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly will. There were a significant number of standards affected, as you saw, about a dozen or so. And because the extension reopens the comment period for 14 days after the um, the release is published in the Federal Register, which has not happened as of today, October 14th. So we're still now looking at comments that may not come in until the end of October or after. We've now pushed back the comment period, potentially added more comments to be reviewed, all of which is to say it builds in delay for for climate as well as the other releases that were included. And and so I think that what we'll see is probably a calendar shift in terms of when things were were likely to be adopted, if you will. I I probably before this release came out was betting pretty heavily that we would see adopted final climate rules by the end of the year. Um, That would be effective by the end of the year, right, and start for for next year. But I think that we'll probably see that get pushed. So it's still possible you would have an adopting release sometime this year in 2022. 
but I think it really is too pressured to see those rules go effective. Just thinking about the timing that we have left for getting things released, adopted and published in the federal register. I, I just don't think that there's now enough time for that to occur, which is certainly probably welcome news to companies that were worried about beginning to comply with climate rules um, next year. Not to say that they can take their foot off the gas at all in terms of preparing. I, I think that those rules are still coming. It just looks to be a little bit later for climate and really the others that are um, included in the, the reopening release. If we're going to be talking about the climate proposal, one question is what effect that would have on small private companies if that proposal is adopted as written, um, because usually small private companies are not complying with SEC reporting requirements. But under this proposal, they would probably have to be estimating or measuring their greenhouse gas emissions so that they can provide that to the large public companies that are their customers so that they can report their scope three emissions. How do you see all of this playing out? Yeah, I mean, so I think for the, the smaller companies, it's still a risk. I think the one question that comes to mind is whether Scope 3 ultimately makes it into the final proposal. Scope 3, as you'll recall, was one of the hot button issues that I think was attributed for the delay in getting out the climate proposal in the first instance. And I think that it's still a significant area of debate in terms of how that fits into the final adopted rules. It, it's quite possible, I think, that there might be a scaling back of the requirements as it relates to publication of Scope 3 data. I don't know whether that's going to actually occur, but I think that, that there's certainly a lot of discussion that that could happen. And Ginsler has indicated that he's open to considering amendments and changes around the scope three. So I think that it remains to be seen what actually happens, but I do think that there may be some relief for the smaller companies. And in fact, the additional time period and additional comments might allow for some further discussion and debate to evolve in that respect, which might ultimately afford those smaller issuers some some relief. I mean, I think they'll certainly have relief from a timing perspective, um, and maybe so from an actual disclosure and obligation perspective. That said, as you're probably aware, separate and apart from the SEC requirement, many companies are publishing Scope 3 reports and Scope 3 data and are really on the leading edge, in part in response to investor demands and, and other stakeholders that are looking for the data. So whether or not the SEC mandates it, I do think that there's still a chance that you could find yourself as a smaller company getting asked to provide the data to a company. Um, the difference is if the company doesn't actually have a legal obligation to publish it, their, their ability to push, I think, for the smaller companies to provide the data is a little bit um, weaker than it might otherwise be. Well, it was certainly a hot topic in Chair Gensler's testimony. I had no idea how many sitting senators on the Senate Banking Committee were actually farmers. Apparently, there's a bunch because it kept coming up in his testimony. Yep. Significant number. I'm going to briefly interrupt Steve and Catherine because we need to keep these lights on. Today's episode of Off the Books is brought to you by Workiva. In this modern world, musicians can make money in several ways. And while it may seem simple, dear listener, it's actually quite complicated. Seriously, just Google how musicians make money. It's bananas. For the sake of time, we're only going to mention a few. They have live performances, merch sales, and streaming royalties. And while there are always exceptions, most artists aren't making a living redoing their work. They're paying the bills by focusing on the new. New tours, new albums, new hoodies. But as you may have guessed, we're here to discuss the exception. Recently, one musician's been seeing success redoing her work. You might know her all too well. These re-recorded albums are making quite the splash in the music industry, breaking new records, re-engaging fans, and making that money. But redundant work in your reporting processes simply isn't benefiting you, is it, dear listener? If you're wasting valuable time copying and pasting, reformatting data, or emailing back and forth revisions, Workiva can help. Automate all that awful, useless copy and pasting, and spend more time actually doing your job. You know, doing what you love and being the rock star you are. Workiva and you, it's a love story. Just go to workiva.com slash podcast. That's W O R K. I-V-A dot com slash podcast and say yes. And we're back from commercial. After Alan's perspective on the climate rule, Steve and Catherine had more questions for Nicola about the FASB's political independence. Take it away, guys. And one of the things that I wonder is that this does introduce just a potential flip-flopping of accounting standards where 
um, you know, you, you end up having this whipsaw of, again, auditors and companies and others trying to, I mean, because if you think about how long it takes the FASB to, to do something, it takes a long time. Well, it can also take a long time for companies to implement these things. We think about revenue recognition, leasing, uh, those things took years. And I just wonder if if you took a step back, if an investor said, well, either through non-GAAP disclosures or maybe other areas of, of information that might supplement uh, my financial reporting, I would actually prefer that consistency, again, rather than potentially flip-flopping based on, you know, whoever's in the White House and then, you know, as a result, whoever's leading the SEC. I, I just say that as my observation. Uh, Catherine or, or, or Nicole, if you want to uh, uh, disagree with me, then that might be an interesting conversation. Well, but Well, one of the things I should, we should uh, note that um, this proposal doesn't say, like, we want this committee, this to be determined committee to actually set accounting standard. Well, it definitely does not say that at all. Um, it just says make recommendations to FASB. So, you know, FASB could very well say, no, we don't like that recommendation. However, it does say that if FASB rejects a recommendation, they would have to uh, re formally respond to it. So they'd really have to justify um, why they didn't agree with with the committee. So it's it's interesting. It's, um, I mean, yes, FASB is a very slow moving organization and a lot of that is on purpose. So you don't, you know, shock the markets with brand new accounting requirements that, you know, transform a financial, you know, company earnings overnight. Um, but at the same time, I think it's pretty valid to acknowledge that, uh, you know, accounting is supposed to reflect economics. It's not supposed to drive economics. And maybe some of the outdated accounting standards just don't reflect the current economics. Well, if I have to put you two on the spot, how likely do you think it will be that this committee will actually form? I have no idea. It's just a recommendation, right? But it passed out of the committee with no dissents. Um, I think it'll be up to the appetite of the current SEC commissioners as to whether or not they think FASB is doing a good enough job to set timely standards, listen to investors, and uh, be independent. And um, at least one of the commissioners publicly said, like, leave FASB alone. Um, uh, but, you know, there might be some appetite from 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 others that think, well, maybe this organization in Norwalk that has a lot of power that we've given it maybe we do need a little bit more um, oversight of it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's I think there's more than an outside chance of that happening. Chair Gensler has indicated his support that he would be willing to do it. And I think I think actually, and I appreciate you bringing that up just just a moment ago, uh, Nicola, with the fact that, hey, the FASB could choose to uh, pursue any recommendations. If they didn't, they would at least need to respond in writing. And that that feels to me like a good argument that somebody like Chair Genzer or others could make to say, well, hey, look, we're not trying to mandate, you know, what their agenda is and what they're doing, but we are having a more clear public view on, hey, this is what we think the investor community needs. Yeah. Okay. So two things real quick. Um, first on Gensler's appetite for the proposal, he's pretty measured um, in his public remarks before the proposal. He just said, like, we welcome or I welcome the recommendations, which I guess one could potentially read that be like, I welcome it gladly versus like, I'm going to read it and see what I think. So I don't know if Gensler necessarily is pro or con like just based on his public statements. I'm not sure um, how excited he is about this. I'd, I'll have to ask him next time I see him maybe. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. And then the second thing, yes, FASB is moving super fast on crypto relatively. Um, it also has um, on its current agenda, it's sort of fast tracking some long requested investor projects such as um, this is all going to sound very nerdy to people who aren't following FASB super closely, but disaggregation of the income statement so that um, companies break out more details about their expenses instead of just recording these like lump buckets where they kitchen sink all their expenses. Um, that's an investor priority. Uh, they released last last week or two weeks ago um, uh, new disclosures for segments that investors have called for for a very, very, very long time. And um, they're moving forward with a project that looked absolutely dead 
um, before the pandemic hit, and that was um, improving disclosures about the income taxes that companies pay, in particular, uh, over, which is like a hot, hot topic. Um, and that project has been on the FASB's agenda for so long, has died two deaths, and then revived and let's see what actually comes out of it. But that is something that investors are closely following. So I think there is some um, action in Norwalk to really, you know, kind of fend off some of the criticism that it's not listening to investors. And I would guess that they perceive this as a somewhat existential threat to the FASB, at least some of these conversations, which I think is probably encouraging them to put a little fuel on the fire to uh, 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 to get moving on some of these critical things. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And the, and they put out this year a big report like, here's all the investors we talked to behind the scenes. And they did that last year as well. Um, so they're really trying, I think. trying. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And, and, and to what extent that's enough, you know, that's the big question. Well, do you two both have time to talk a little bit more about this guidance on digital assets and crypto? Sure. Sure. Because you were talking about consistency. This seems like this is going to be blowing up consistency, at least when we make the switch over to accounting for digital assets with fair value accounting, right? I mean, how, what sort of reaction do you think investors will have to this change? I'll let Steve, this is Steve's turn for sure. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I, I don't know about that. I, I think you bring up a good point about the consistency question. I, I, I think I would clarify that digital assets was never really clear and settled and established to begin with. You know, th this emerged, this became a thing, you know, suddenly as a business, I can't ignore crypto. Uh, my customers are going to want to pay for it, or that might be a competitive advantage for me to incorporate it in my payment streams. And so, so, so you make those, let's say, economic or competitive decisions. Well, then you've got to answer the question about the accounting. And that was exactly where we found ourselves in uh, at Overstock, I can say, is, is you know, the, the first large national retailer to accept uh, uh, Bitcoin. Um, and so we had made that as a, as a competitive decision, but then faced with, OK, well, now we own this Bitcoin and actually other cryptocurrencies. What do we do with it? And so I actually feel like, Catherine, to your point, um, this will introduce that consistency, settle the issues so we don't have to keep thinking about it and talking about it. I mean, the way that it works just for audience is that you would think of crypto today like you would uh, inventory. I pay a certain amount of money for it. I put it on my balance sheet. But then if I don't, you know, uh, but then I need to be looking at it for impairment. Is it still worth what I paid for it? And the way that it works is that if that value has decreased, um, I need to write that down. I recognize a charge and expense to my income statement. But the odd thing is, is that let's say if the value goes up and that doesn't often happen with inventory, but it certainly happens with cryptocurrency, I don't actually get to write it back up. Um, I don't get to recognize that increase in value until I actually sell it. Well, that creates a very strong disconnect, again, between the economics of cryptocurrency and, and those assets and what is being represented in your in your financial statements. A really big deal for those companies that have significant cryptocurrency holdings. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't call this a watershed moment, but pretty close. And it certainly will be for those companies that will be impacted in a big way. Um, after FASB's vote, I got some you know PR pitches saying that – um, if FASB moves to fair value, it's going to make more companies want to invest in crypto or hold crypto on their balance sheet. So they don't have these counterintuitive, um, you know, impairments that they never can record, you know, they can never increase their value if um, the price of Bitcoin or whatever goes back up. So, I mean, I think I, I, I just based on my inbox, <laughs> um, I, I think people uh, generally would favor that accounting compared to what the current model is. But it's going to introduce, I mean, fair value is just by its nature up and down. So it'll introduce volatility. Yeah. What, what's so ironic to me is that that was the treatment, this whole you write it down, but you don't write it up until you sell it. And we're talking about crypto assets here, you know, technological and future thinking and whatever. That was actually how Overstock recorded the gold and silver holdings that we had, which is a whole maybe whole other episode. But we actually had like a warehouse actually like 
full of gold, full of silver. Our CEO at the time, our CEO at the time, uh, thought that that was important for us to have, and that's exactly how we would treat that. The price of gold would go down. We would write it down, uh, but it would never go back up unless we actually disposed of it. And it's, you know, I can't think of a more ancient asset than that. But yet, that is exactly how we were treating these new modern cryptocurrencies. It just seems very ironic to me. That's awesome. Well, it seems like it's come to the time when we have to ask Nicola a closing question of the day. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, in the spirit of trying to get FASB to act a little bit faster, um, we have a similar closing question. So what is a rule or product launch or movie release that it feels like you have been waiting years for? The next season of Dairy Girls. I rewatched uh, the first two seasons on Netflix when I had COVID last month, and I got to the end, and I was like, I just want more. Um, and it's magically back, so I get to watch it this weekend. Excellent. Netflix is going to be the brunt of this question because I have answered... So so we've actually asked this question a number of different... And I, I generally have the same thing uh, or the same response, and it's Stranger Things. Yes, I know the recent season came out, but they didn't they didn't end it. They didn't wrap it up. So now I've got to wait for another, you know, for season five, I think it is. And who knows? I'm probably have to wait another like two or three years. So uh, Netflix, if you could be listening to this conversation, we would appreciate some uh, faster action. How about you, Catherine? What are you waiting for? Is it too soon to say Batgirl? I'm going to be waiting for a very <laughs> long time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> You are going to be waiting for a very long time. And that's an impairment issue that we've been talking about. Yes, that's right. Good tie-in. Well, uh, uh, Nicola, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. I'm Catherine Sai. That was Steve Soder. And this has been Off the Books presented by Workiva. Please subscribe, leave a review, and tell your buddies if you liked the show. What did you think of the episode? What do you want to hear us talk about next? Drop us a line at offthebooks at workiva.com. Surf's up, and we'll see you on the next wave. Bye.